morning, everyone. My name is Brady. I'm a vicar here at Grace Hill Church, and our reading for this morning comes from Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 and 22, and it says this, Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish, and free from accusation. This is our reading for this morning. You may be seated. And if you all join me for a word of prayer here this morning as we prepare for our message. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, um, you are just so good to us. And, and we thank you that you have given us this opportunity to be here, to, to be in your word, to hear what you have to say to us. I pray that in this time, Lord, you would guide us, and strengthen us, teach us new things, and help us to grow closer to you and, and closer to those around us. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, last week, uh, we began a new sermon series studying the book of Colossians. And, and what Pastor uh, explained to us last week about this book is that Colossians is a, a very real letter that was written by a, a very real man, the Apostle Paul. And it was written about 2,000 years ago to a very real group of people. Uh, people at a church in a city called Colossae, which can be found today in modern-day Turkey. And, and the thing about the church at Colossae is that it was not started by Paul himself. Um, it, we believe it was started by a man named Epaphras who had learned from Paul. And what we find out as we read this letter is that Epaphras has apparently contacted the apostle and explained that in his church in Colossae, there are some things going on that just don't seem right. And so Paul then writes this letter to the church to try and help straighten, it, straighten up some of these issues that have arisen. Last week we heard, as, as Pastor taught from chapter 1, uh, the number of different characteristics which describe who our Savior Jesus is. And today we're going to be focusing uh, not so much on who Jesus is, but what he has done for us, which is the gospel message itself, the gospel message of what Christ has done in our lives, and the gospel message which, which Paul and all ministers have been given the responsibility to preach and its truth. But something unique about our passages for today, and you heard our reading starting at verse 21, and, and what we're going to be looking at today actually goes all the way into chapter 2 to the beginning. And in that section of Scripture, Paul uses a, a word to describe this gospel message, and actually to describe Christ himself, and that word is mystery. Three different times throughout this passage, Paul uses the word mystery as, as his descriptor of who Christ is. And so, for instance, at the end of chapter, or verse 25, going into verse 26, he says this, God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. And then in verse 27, he says this, to them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And then in the opening verses of chapter 2, he goes on to write this. My goal is that they... Let's see. Can we advance that slide to the next one there? Sorry, everyone, we're having just a little trouble getting the next slide up here. Well, I'll just go, I'll just go ahead and read it to you here. So in verse, the opening verses of chapter 2, Paul says this, My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding, in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ. He explains that his goal and his purpose in the work that he does is, among other things, in order that they, and, and for us today, that we may know the mystery of God, which is Christ himself. The gospel message about Christ is a mystery, and in fact, he himself is a mystery as well. And I want to step back just for a second. Who out there enjoys a good mystery story? Any mystery lovers out there? 
And, and I know for me, I, I love a good mystery, and I think the reason that I enjoy those is because they often contain a number of different twists and turns as the story unfolds for us. That, that though things usually work out in the end, it usually works out in a way that would have been hard to predict. See, there, there's an element of the unexpected when we have these mystery stories. They're, they're a bit unpredictable. And um, I, for one, do love a good mystery. I don't know if any of you recognize these folks here. These are the, the Scooby-Doo crew. And, you know, my girls and I, we've been watching the old Scooby-Doo cartoon. Like, I'm not sure how they found it, but I'm kind of glad they did because <laughs> it's been a lot of fun getting to sit back and watch them experience the joys of a good mystery. They're, they're trying to guess what's going to happen next, and, and if you've ever seen this show before, at the end, usually a mask is, is taken off of, of someone's head to reveal who is behind it the whole time, and so they're trying to guess, well, who's it going to be? Who's going to be under the mask? And I have to admit that I get kind of sucked in, too, because even though it's a, it's a simple children's cartoon, all of those elements of mystery are there, and so it's, it sucks you, and you want to know how things turn out. And I think that if we consider these aspects of mystery, then it makes sense that Paul calls the very gospel of Jesus Christ, and in fact Christ himself, as a mystery to us. Think for a second about the Jewish people. These were God's chosen people, and the entire Old Testament and, and really much of the New Testament tells us all about them. They were God's chosen people, and they knew that a day was coming when deliverance and salvation would be theirs. This is what the prophets for centuries and even millennia had told them, that, that there was a day coming when they would be delivered from whatever it was that was facing them. And so they built up in their minds what their Savior would look like. And I think what happened is they got a little too caught up in the earthly aspects of their challenges and their struggles because to them, a, a, a Savior, a true Savior, he would probably be a military leader, a, a political leader of some kind. He would probably possess a lot of earthly power and authority. He would be impressive to look at. He would come on the scene with a lot of pomp and circumstance. But then God sends the Savior and he sends God the Son who took on flesh, and it's Jesus Christ, who's born as a, a lowly baby boy in a feeding trough in a stable, and then he grows up in an insignificant city in Nazareth to an insignificant family. In his ministry here on earth, he doesn't go and overthrow the Roman government like all of the Jewish people had hoped he would. Rather, he runs around the countryside and he preaches God's word to them. He heals people of their sicknesses, he casts out demons, he tells people that they've been forgiven of their sins, and ultimately he, he's murdered on a Roman cross. And it was too much for the people. This was not the king they expected him. It was too mysterious. This is not who they had built up in their minds he would be, and so they reject him. It was too much of a twist and a turn in the story. But this was the mystery of God's plan for salvation, Christ Jesus. But before we rush to judgment, I think it's true that you and I do the exact same thing that they had done all those years ago. Isn't Christ still a mystery to us too? We look around ourselves and we see the things that we face, the challenges and the struggles that come up in our lives. And just like the Jewish people of that day, we get caught up in the earthly rather than the eternal. We say, you know what, God, uh, forgiveness of sins, sure, that sounds great. New life in you, oh, okay, fine. Hope of a future, of eternal life, that, that all sounds good and all, but, but God, don't forget to give me that job that I really want. Don't forget to make sure I have enough money in my bank account to live the lifestyle that I want to live. Don't forget to give that perfect spouse to me in my life. Don't forget to fix my marriage and fix my other relationships. God, all of those things that you want to give me, they sound wonderful, and I know Jesus gives them to us, but don't forget to give me the things that I really care about. See, just like the Jewish people, we build up in our minds what our Savior should look like, and too often, it doesn't match the Savior that God actually sent to us. It can become overshadowed by the things that we want here and now. We get caught up in the earthly, rather the eternal. And so I think it's important at these times, these times when we're tempted to create a Jesus of our own creation, when we're tempted to 
focus more on the things that we want rather than things that he came to give, I think it's important that we are reminded of, of the truth of the gospel message, this, this mystery that Paul is trying to tell us about at the end of Colossians chapter 1. And so that's what we're going to do for the rest of the time here. And we're going to focus on our reading for this morning. And what we read in verse 21 where we started was this, that once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, another translation says something like, as shown by your evil deeds. And the truth is this, we are alienated from God. And I think that this in some ways is a mystery to us too because a lot of times I don't think we recognize how serious sin actually is. This isn't a situation where you and I are just a little bit bad and we just need to be just a little bit better. This is a situation where you and I are completely corrupt in our nature. And you and I need complete salvation from a complete Savior. You know, when sin entered the world, back when Adam and Eve committed that first sin, there was no part of our humanity that wasn't touched by that sin. So things like our emotions, our ability to think and our ability to reason, our sense of morality, our knowledge of right and wrong, all of these things were corrupted by the curse of sin. And so we find ourselves in a predicament. We are alienated from God, our Creator, because of our, our sinful nature and because of our sinful deeds. And because God in His holiness and in His righteousness says that there's a price that has to be paid for that sin. That He cannot stand to be in the presence of sin, and so we are separated from Him. Paul himself tells us in Romans chapter 6 that the wages of sin is death. See, we're up utterly separated from our God. The penalty that we owe him is our own lives, and we seem to be without hope. You know, a few years back, um, my wife and I, we, we visited the Grand Canyon, and uh, this was technically before we have kids. You, you can't see it in the picture, but my wife, she's about seven months pregnant with our oldest daughter in this picture, and um, so Maddie, our oldest daughter, she likes to say that she has actually been to the Grand Canyon, which... I guess I can't argue with her. She, she was right alongside there with us. Um, but the other thing about this picture is um, this was when selfie sticks were just kind of bursting onto the scene. And so I, I thought I was so cool. I, I didn't need anyone's help to take all these cool pictures of us at the Grand Canyon. Um, but what I soon came to realize is that when you're at the Grand Canyon, a selfie stick just won't quite, quite do it justice. You really need to step back to kind of get the full picture of what the canyon is. And so that's what I did in this picture. And, and I think the thing I love about this picture is it shows just how great that expanse is. Between the North Rim and the South Rim and the Grand Canyon, it seems insurmountable. I mean, imagine trying to jump across that. You know, good luck. You're not going to make it very far. And, and I think when I think about our alienation from God, our separation from Him, this is a picture that comes into my mind. That expanse between the one side to the other side and I think that's a good starting point for us, but in reality, I think it is even further than that. Because when it comes to our relationship with God, we aren't just passively separated from Him with a gulf in between us. We are actively separated from Him. That, that our sinful nature leads us to not only be on the opposite side of the Grand Canyon, but also sprinting as fast as we can in the other direction to, to get even further from Him. We are hostile to God and his things. And, and in fact, in our reading for today, Paul reminds us that we aren't just alienated from God. We are, in fact, the very enemies of God in our sinful nature. It's, it's true. We're, we find ourselves in a tough spot, but that's not the end of the story. Because it's at this point uh, of this part of the letter that Paul, he brings in what I believe to be the sweetest word in the entire Bible, and it's this word, but... He says this, But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death. See, the second part of this mystery is that, first of all, we're alienated from God, but the second part says this, we have been reconciled to God through Christ. That the unbridgeable gap which was there has now been bridged. And, and this, in, in, in truth, too, is a mystery to us 
because there's no way that that gap could ever have been bridged unless God himself was the one that took the initiative. And that's what he did. He made a bridge for us, and that bridge is Christ Jesus, the one who is truly God and truly man, and the one who left the glories of heaven and entered into an earthly existence, the creator who takes on the form of one of his creatures. This is the Jesus Christ who is our bridge back to God. And the even more mysterious part of this all is that it is an entirely free gift to us. You don't have to earn this gift from God. He gives it to you free of charge. All you have to do is receive it through faith in his son, Jesus Christ. Talk about an unbelievable twist and turn in our story. But the mystery continues on. And, and in verse 22, uh, Paul goes on to tell us this, that, that we have been reconciled for a reason, and, to, and this is it, to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. You know, we say this all the time on our baptism Sundays that, that when you come into the family of God, that you are washed clean of your sins. And, and we like to say that phrase that Christ Jesus wraps you up in his righteous white robe. That's a phrase, try to say that five times. I had to practice a few times so I didn't mess that up. Righteous white robe. Because it's not just our slate that was wiped clean. It's not just that our sin was transferred from us to Jesus, at the same time, he also transfers to us his very righteousness. It's, it's a double transfer. And the only one who's lived a perfect life of perfect righteousness, he gives us credit for all of those righteous deeds which he has lived out in his life. And once again, we see that it's all free of charge, not having to be earned, only to be received as an incredible gift, that before God on the final day, you stand before him, as Paul says here, free from accusation. There's no more, no more guilt that you have to feel. Satan can't tell you anymore that you are a sinner because in Christ Jesus, you have been washed clean and freed from that condemnation that once hung over your head. It's an incredible gift that Jesus has given us. But, but it's not done yet. He continues to keep giving. The final part of our mystery for today is that Jesus not only has saved you and washed you clean, but he continues to live in you every day of your life as a Christian. Verse 27 tells us this, that to them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Jesus, towards the end of his life, he told his disciples that it was going to be good for them when he left because that meant that the Holy Spirit was going to come and live in them for the rest of their lives. And the Holy Spirit, what it did is it came in and it guided them and strengthened them. And the same is true for us as Christians here today. Paul elsewhere, he tells us in his letter to another church, the church at Corinth, in his letter to the Corinthians, he asks them this question, do you not realize that Christ Jesus is now in you? And I ask you guys all the same question here today, do you not realize that Christ Jesus is now in you? And, and, and what is his spirit doing in your lives? Well, he's guiding you in wisdom and knowledge to better know his will. He's strengthening you to better follow him. He's coming into your life. He's giving you a brand new heart that is in line with the very heart that he has. And he's giving us the energy and the power that we need to work for him here in this life. And so this is the mystery of God, the, the mystery of the gospel, the mystery of Christ Jesus himself, that though we were separated from God by our sin, that we have been forgiven and redeemed by the Son who took on flesh, who willingly faced death, who then gloriously rose again from the grave on that day, and who now continues to live with you and in you to lead you ever closer to him. It's mysterious because it probably isn't the way that you would have written the script. It's mysterious because at times that's not the Jesus we want but this is the Jesus that we have been given, and I can assure you it's the very Jesus that you need most. And this is the incredible gift that we have through his death and through his life. And I hope that, that as you recognize, as we all recognize our need for a Savior, that we would see that in Jesus we have a Savior that is overwhelmingly greater than every need that we, that we have. 
what Jesus has done is he has bought you with his blood. He has reconciled you to the Father. And I pray that the Holy Spirit would work in our hearts each day to help us better grasp this mystery and to live each day in the light of this most amazing truth of, of who he is and, and what he has done for us. Um, we're going to move now into a time of confession as we kind of reflect on, on what we've heard here today. And, and so if you would join me, we'll bow our heads and we'll, we'll confess before our Lord here today. Heavenly Father, it is true that at times um, we have found ourselves disappointed or, or even angered, Lord, when we don't get what we want. When God doesn't answer us in the way we would like, when the Jesus that we have been given is far removed from the Jesus that we actually want. God, we take a moment now to confess our sins before you that we have carried with us here today. Lord, have mercy on us. Forgive us for our rebellious hearts. Heal us and free us from the bondage of the sin that separates us so far from you. And help us to walk in this new life that you have given to us. Amen. The good news that I get to share with you here today is that though that unbridgeable gap has existed between us and our God, that, that Jesus Christ has come in and he has built that bridge so that we could cross over to be reconciled back to him, that he has made a way for you to be forgiven and redeemed, that in his love he has sent his son, Jesus Christ. And that as you leave here today, I hope you would know for certain that you have been forgiven of all your sins. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen.